This is one of my favorite quotes, and you know this quote probably very well. It's on the website of the Pat Tillman Foundation. Uh, somewhere inside we hear a voice. It leads us in, uh, in the direction of who we wish to become, but it's up to us whether to follow it or not. And it was said by this guy, who clearly followed it, and, and, and I know I'm going to preach to the choir uh, for the next few minutes. Um, and you all have the absolute, the fact that you're here, you have the absolute capacity to follow it, whatever it is. I started on my own kind of journey looking at this and thinking about talking about it. I, I was asked to speak to a group of Mensa people. Is before I say anything else, is anybody in here at Mensa? I, I'm not either. So when I started, it was about, I don't know, 7,500 people. And I started off saying, it was a Friday afternoon, and it was middle of summer in Phoenix, and it was jam packed. And I said, thank you so much for being here. Frankly, I'm shocked about how many people are so enthusiastic about the women's reproductive cycle. <laughs> Which I thought was incredibly, incredibly funny. <laughs> and it got no laughs at all. And so it, it started out kind of slow. Um, but by the end of it, they kind of warmed up to me and maybe me to them a little bit. But at the end, one of them raised their hand. And now these are, as I understand it, have to be over IQ over 160 to get into men's up. So at the end of this, the guy stood up. He had a pocket protector, I swear to God. And he said, hey, this is all well and good. And we all are super excited to go out and change the world. But tomorrow, when we wake up and look in the mirror, it won't be, it won't be John Shupal we see. It'll be us. And, and then what do you have to say about that? And you can feel the air just get sucked out of the room. And I thought, man, if these people who have super high IQs are having a hard time getting it together to change the world, what does that do for the rest of us? Which really is the kind of the impetus for me to start on this thing. So I started calling this reflections, this views from just over the horizon. Uh, that's me. And uh, it's really about looking ahead and beyond and trying to figure out what traits and qualities do you have today that you count in your playbook? And of all the groups I've spoken to, hands down, I've spoken to some really cool groups. You guys are by far the outliers, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. But what traits and qualities do you have, do you possess now, and what can you improve upon for the years to come? Because the studies are the people who have a five and ten year vision, if they look ahead that far, really do much better because then they have a path that they organize themselves on. And, and they all know they're not going to stay on that path. They all know they'll veer out and things will change, but they'll adapt and cope and, and, ch and change with it along the way. So I'm not original. I stole this look ahead thing from the USS uh, Stennis. The USS Stennis is a nuclear uh, powered aircraft carrier named after Senator John Stennis who had a look ahead on his desk. And it, does anybody know what immundo optimum means? Oh, good, because I never took Latin either. It means the best in the world. So there's about 6,000 sailors. Anybody here I served on an aircraft carrier before I put my foot in my mouth? All right, so when I put my foot in my mouth, raise your hand and say, here's where you're an idiot. So 6,000 sailors, two nuclear reactors, they change them out after 25 years. They go, 50, they go this thing will be built for 50 years. Uh, they change them out every million miles. This is how far the nuclear reactors can take the ship. They spend $60,000 a day on food. Uh, and the most common surgical procedure they do, this really struck me, is a vasectomy. Is we, don't do any, we don't do anything elective, but we do a lot of vasectomies, which I never really got my head around. But apparently, when you're at sea, there's an impetus to get snipped. I don't know what that impetus is, but it's there. So I invited you out and talked to a group of sailors uh, on the USS Stennis. So I boarded this thing called the Carry On Board Delivery. That's me with my hydrocephalus head. And I, land, I didn't land, I was in the back screaming for dear life. Uh, and this plane that landed on the aircraft carrier, which was very cool, there's a Stennis from a far away. And while I'm in Stennis, I see a really lot of really cool stuff that you guys are probably so used to, it's boring. But for me, being the first time in an aircraft carrier, I mean, it was kind of badass. I mean, I really liked it. So I was got to go up and ride in the, in the bridge with Captain Matt Wetloffer. And he said, what's the coolest thing you've done so far? And I said, well, seeing all the carrier ops and the rest of the landing. He goes, no, no, he goes, Wait to meet the crew. When you talk to the crew, they will be the coolest, coolest part of this aircraft carrier. Because he said the average age on it, correct me if I'm wrong, was 22 years old. All that about, that about right? So five to 6,000 people, 22 years old, average age, all working together to move that huge ship around the world. Really impressive. So I did, and they were cool. So at the end of 36 hours, got back on, again, me, hydrocephalus head, Fly, shoot off the catapult back out again, very cool, but you're facing backwards so you don't have quite the sensation. And on the way back, I started thinking, how does this happen? How does, how does, how does that Captain Kathleen Wetlaufer get all these people to act in concert, and then how do they, in turn, 
work and improve their skills to hone them to such a fine degree that we that boat becomes such a huge um, stabilizing force in the, in the industry. So I thought, or not in the industry, in the country. So I started thinking, okay, what is the crucial question? And the crucial question, as I see it, is how do we break the mold to achieve things we never thought possible? What small changes can we make that have the biggest possible outcomes? Because that's, that's what ROI is, right? So, is he, so I spent the last year working with a neuropsychologist, um, a guy out of California, and I can't really just wanted to up my game. So for a year, I spent a lot of money, met with him a lot, through all his battery of tests, and, and heard what he had to think, and heard what he had to say, and it was really interesting. Um, but one of the things I learned is that our brains are hardwired to play small, to fear the future, to ignore, to delay, to resist, to stay lost in the fog. And I have to say again, out of all the groups, probably doesn't apply to you guys, but for everybody else out there, this is kind of how their brains and what they revert back to because it's comfortable. So speaking teleologically, looking at how this, why we are, the way we are, if you think about it back in the day, you know, if you venture outside your cave and there's a saber-toothed tiger out there, but you're the brave one in your crowd, you're the entrepreneurial cave person, you probably get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or clubbed by your neighbor. Well, those were the, the, that was then, I guess, and this is now. So our brains have the capacity, however, to really innovate, contribute large, play big, take risks, take the initiative. And, and it's this that has really marked the upward progression of mankind uh, throughout the millenniums. And occasionally you get beaten or eaten by the proverbial saber-toothed tiger, but, but certainly not as much as you used to. So speaking of ROI, what are the smallest changes you can make in the near term that will impact the longer term, and then that you can achieve the biggest outcome? Really, that's what, that's what ROI is, right? Smallest you can put in, biggest return on your investment. And that's really what you should focus on, is that middle aspect of it. So in 2015 and then beyond, where can you look ahead to? So before this last year started, I started working with this guy. He said, I want you to write down your goals for the year. And then I want you to think of them on a month-to-month -month basis and then a week-to-week -week basis and then a day-to-day -day basis. And you don't have to be you know, an engineer about the thing. But if you start thinking in that sort of term and say, all right, I know where I want to get to here. So one of the things I do is I try to go back to school every 10 years. Sometimes I go a little shorter, sometimes I go a little longer. But last year, I did this Six Sigma thing. And I knew at the start of the year, I wanted to finish it by the end of the year. And I knew that I was woefully inadequate in a lot of things, math being one of them. So I went back and started looking at some math to try and figure out, okay, what math do I need to do the statistics to get through the Six Sigma? And that's just one kind of poor example of it. But if you start looking ahead, what can you do that impacts other people? Well, certainly respect everyone you meet, forgive where you can, where you should, paying attention to smaller details that lead to the biggest outcomes. For example, reading a new book every week was one of mine. Uh, being, hard, being kind to the hard to be kind crowd. I work in a very busy trauma center in downtown Phoenix. And we see a lot of indigents, and we see a lot of people who are on drugs and alcohol and all sorts of things. And sometimes when they spit at you, they're, they're kind of hard to be kind to. Uh, but those are the ones who kind of need kindness the most. And so they, okay, I, I can up my game on that. But at the end of the day, what can you do? Small, incremental things to change the world. I mean, that's what, I think that's what you're here for. That's certainly what the Tillman um, Scholarship is all about. So for me, one small thing I did, well, they started just making a checklist every day. And I'm a checklist, a tall Gwani checklist manifesto sort of person. And they kind of did it anyway, but I did it more mentally. Uh, previously, and I'm sure I forgot a lot of things. So I started writing things down, and those checklists really corresponded to this one year, five year, 10 year plan, knowing full well that in five years I'll probably be living in Tibet as a Buddhist. I mean, who really knows? But, but at least along the way, I will have accomplished some things I wanted to, wanted to check off. So what can you do on a day-to-day -day basis, small incremental changes, so you don't forget the small but important things to have the biggest outcome at the end of it?